fantastic day today. Today, we're going to be talking about a big leak that you must fix to succeed at poker tournaments. Last time I tried to stream, it didn't work on YouTube, so I just want to make sure we're working on YouTube right now. It says we're streaming, so that's good. Streaming, 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 streaming. Streaming on all platforms. Sometimes it just works out right. That is good. Understand that in poker tournaments and in poker and in, well, most most aspects of life, to be fair, you can mess up in all sorts of ways in poker. You can be far too loose. You can be far too tight. You can be overly aggressive. You can be overly passive. You can be bad on the flop, bad on the turn, bad on the river, whatever. You can be really, really bad in all sorts of ways. But what a lot of people do wrong when studying all things is they try to look at the fun, interesting, extravagant stuff. They want to look at things like when should I be folding three of a kind on the turn? But in reality, you have to ask, how often does that actually occur? And the answer is, that does not occur pretty much ever. I just want you to consider something. How much money do you think you would lose, on average, every 100 hands, if you fold four of a kind on the flop every time you make it? Or on the turn or on the river. If you ever get four of a kind, you just fold it. Be a pretty bad play. But uh, how much do you think you'd actually lose? Well, the answer is almost nothing. You may say, what? You have four of a kind. You're going to win the pot every time. Yeah, but you don't actually make four of a kind very often at all, right? And because this essentially never occurs, you really don't need to spend all of that much time considering that spot, especially if you don't know how to play all the common spots to begin with. So you want to consider what spots come up on a regular basis, right? And what happens all the time is you play before the flop. Before the flop, you get dealt some hands, and you got to figure out what to do. Now, from first position, if you were to fold literally every hand from under the gun, nine-handed, yeah, you'd lose money. It wouldn't be ideal, but it wouldn't be that detrimental. But if you screw up the big blind, which you play, well, you should be playing kind of wide on a regular basis against a raise, you're going to end up losing a lot of money. If you play the button very poorly, you're going to end up losing a lot of money because these spots come up very often and on top of that, you should be playing very wide ranges. Am I on the right microphone here? It looks like I'm really loud. Am I really loud today? Let's see. Properties. Maybe I just turn it down a little bit. Maybe I'm just excited and I'm yelling. Don't yell, Jonathan. Don't yell. I actually traveled with this microphone last time and I dented it up to death in my... Uh, Luggage. Look at that, isn't it? God. Clearly says it's working. Good morning, good morning. We're back. I don't know what happened there. You know how it goes. You know how it goes. You know how it goes. We try something new. Try to show you all the microphone. The microphone's broken is what I'm telling you all. I need to get a new microphone. Okay. When looking at this scenario, 40... Well, looking at the scenario in the big blind, you can discuss this situation from all different scenarios, right? You can look at spots where under the gun raises and you call in the big blind. You can look at spots where the button raises and you call in the big blind or when you're 300 big blinds deep or when you're 20 big blinds deep or whatever. I have a poker coaching webinar starting in 56 minutes if the microphone keeps working. 54 minutes now, 56 minutes before the microphone broke. And we're going to discuss a common spot today where the button raises 
and then you're in the big blind. That's a spot that should come up pretty often. Again, if you're going to be studying poker in depth, you want to be looking at all sorts of scenarios, such as when an early position raises, when someone raises and someone else calls, et cetera, et cetera. There's a mute button on the mic. I know how to work the microphone. What actually happened is there's, I'm not even going to touch it. There's a little cord at the bottom. And in the process of traveling with this thing, it got a little bit wiggly and it got a little bit wiggly and it did not fall out, but it did get a little bit wiggly. And apparently that quote unquote, unplugged the microphone. Everyone thinks I'm clueless when it comes to technology. I'm halfway clueless, but not totally clueless. Believe it or not, the lights were still on. It was still working and it was not muted. I would demonstrate how to mute it, but I'm not gonna do that. All right, so we're gonna be looking at a spot 40 big blinds deep when the button raises and you're in the big blind. That's the only thing we're gonna be discussing today. And we're gonna try to keep it simple because this spot comes up a lot. And if you can just play this one spot pretty well, you're gonna plug a whole lot of your leaks. So here we have handy dandy poker coaching preflop charts. Now, if you want to be discussing if there are payout implications, et cetera, et cetera, again, that complicates things, but we do have some ICM charts here, whether you're playing live or online, because they do have a different anti-structure sometimes. And you can study those scenarios in depth. We're going to be discussing specifically though today, when you are playing 40 big blinds deep with no payout implications in the earlier middle stages of a tournament. So poker coaching app, very easy. You can load it up on your phone. You can load it up on your computer. Go to GTO Tournament, 40 Big Blinds Deep, and the Big Blind. Let's say versus a raise from the button. That's a little bit off the screen down here, but I promise I'm selecting it. Okay. Let me move this down a little bit, I suppose. There we go. Okay. Here's what we should be doing. 40 Big Blinds Deep against the button raise. Now, hands in light red are re-raising. Hands in dark red are going all in. Hands in green are calling. Okay, so first things first, where do you, you, you watching today, this is, I'm here for all of you, the 20 of you that click the like button, the other 63, you know, come on, everybody, come on, everybody, click the like button, get with it. When you're in this scenario, 40 big blinds deep, are you going all in ever? A lot of people never go all in. And that's a problem. A lot of people also try to three bet with the same strategy they should be three betting with when they're deeper stacked. For example, 80 big blinds deep, same spot. Look at all the hands that are three betting now. Hands in this region like to three bet when you're playing 40 big blinds deep. What about 60 big blinds deep? Similar stuff. Hands in this region like to three bet. 40 big blinds deep though. Look at this. Almost none of them three bet. It's a very different strategy required, right? So if you just study, call it preflop charts that a lot of people do, they try to keep it super simple. You're gonna find it super simple just using something like this strategy where you're not shoving anything where you're not three betting, where, where you are three betting these hands is a big mistake because when you're um, 40 big blinds deep. So which hands really like to shove 40 big blinds deep? Small and medium pairs, ace jack and ace queen. Those really like to shove. Now we do have king queen offsuit shoving as well. Fine. We have a little bit of these other hands as call them bluffs. You know, fine. I think in reality, if you wanted to be somewhat implementable with this, maybe you just always shove ace two offsuit. Forget the king seven offsuit, the nine eight suited, the queen seven suited, and the king seven suited. Never shove those. Then shove ace queen, ace jack, king queen. It's fine. Then nines and lower, just shove all them. Fine. Like whatever. That's going to be relatively implementable and not get you in too much trouble. Then you three bet small with all the best hands. So say your opponent makes it two, you make it something like six and a half or six or seven or something like that. With tens and better, ace ten suited and better, king queen suited, and ace king offsuit. And then you need to find some bluffs. What are your bluffs going to be? Well, if you look at these bluffs, they come entirely from ace x offsuit, king x offsuit, queen x offsuit, jack x offsuit, 10 x offsuit, and a little bit of nine eight. Okay, to be implementable again, you can do this in all sorts of ways. You can just straight mix it up, which I think is fine. Just three bet all these hands, whatever you get them about 25-ish percent of the time. I think that's very reasonable and viable. You could also just three bet something like 10 seven offsuit every time, queen eight offsuit every time, and king six offsuit every time probably fine, right? Maybe you throw in the ace four offsuit as well. Maybe king jack offsuit every time. You know, you know what I mean? Like you got to mix it up. Most people though, do not bluff nearly often enough in this spot. What they do instead is they three bet all the best hands. Actually, to be fair, they use a strategy more like this where they're three betting all the best hands. Some of these hands that are okay. And then these hands in this region sometimes, maybe not even these hands in this region all that often, but just all the best hands. And they don't have a shoving range and they don't have a bluffing range. What you're gonna see as you get shorter and shorter stacked, hands like this 
10 8 offsuit, 10 7 offsuit, queen 8 offsuit become very good three betting hands. Can you skip the big blind all in versus button in low stakes games? I would almost say, if anything, you want to be shoving wider in low stakes games. Why? Well, let's take a look at what your opponent should be doing. On the button, what should they be raising with? A lot of people, I would actually say, raise perhaps wider than this on the button, 40 big blinds deep. Most people raise 8 7 offsuit, 7 6 offsuit, 6 5 offsuit, 7 4 suited, 4 3 suited. Most people raise all these hands 40 big blinds deep on the button. Which means, naturally, if they're raising a little bit wider, then they'll be folding more often to 3 bets. So 3 bet wider, right? Let's look at what they should do versus a 3 bet all in from the big blind. You'll see here, they should call off fives and better. Jack 10 suited. Is anybody calling Jack 10 suited for 40 big blinds? I don't think so. Ace 8 suited and better. Are they calling off Ace 9 suited? King 10 suited? King Jack suited? King Queen offsuit? Ace 10 offsuit for 40 big blinds? Maybe they do, but I don't think so. You have to ask, are your opponents going to call wider than this for 40 big blinds? They make it 2, you make it 40. Put yourself in your opponent's shoes. Give yourself Ace 10 suited. I mean, I probably call ace 10 suited. Give me, give me, give yourself a ace 10 offsuit or pocket fives or king 10 suited. Look, I'm telling you, I'm going to fold those every time against most people. And I, I even know what the chart looks like, right? So if I'm sitting here folding these spots that are close to break even, I think most people in general are folding these hands. Why is this the correct play if no one's going to do it? I'm saying you should be shoving wider because that exploits the fact that your opponent does not call this range. If your opponent calls slightly wider than this, Maybe you don't want to shove quite so wide. If your opponent is going to call way tighter, though, then you should be taking the aggressive action far more often. Consider what happens versus a non-3-bet all-in. They should be continuing with this. If they're going to call tighter than this and shove tighter than this, you should be 3-betting more than the chart I just showed you, right? So is your opponent going to call your 3-bet? Queen-6 suited, King-5 suited, Jack-8 suited, 7-6 suited. Queen 10 offsuit, ace 8 offsuit, ugh. All those feel pretty ugly. So if anything, you should be three betting more. Why are these the correct calls if they are unrealistic and nobody does it? We are looking at as if two players are playing perfectly against each other. If your opponent's, if your opponent in the big blind is not gonna three bet enough, then yeah, you should call tighter. But if they do three bet enough, if I am using the strategy that I just showed you in the big blind and the opponent plays tighter than this, you're going to completely run them over and smash them. And if they play wider than this, to be fair, you're going to extract far more value than you should with your good hands. And you're going to smash them. If they do not play this strategy, you're going to beat them. And so your job becomes thinking, how do they play this spot poorly? If they are playing this spot poorly by being too tight, you in turn want to be more aggressive. So, I just told you, I don't think they're calling off against an all-in often enough. And I think they're opening a little bit too wide preflop. And against a three-bet, a non-all-in three-bet, that's what we're looking at here, are they going to call these hands on the cusp? I don't think so. I mean, if you gave me the ace-eight offsuit, I'm just folding. Ace-seven offsuit, I'm just going to fold. King-five suited, fold, fold. Queen-six suited, nine-seven suited. Fold, 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 right? And I even think I play pretty well in position getting okay odds. I think most people are going to play a little bit tighter. Are they also going to shove these hands in red? I probably shove a little bit too much here because I think most people don't call often enough when they do 3-bet. But <laughs> that's a whole different story. Um, I do think most people probably do shove kind of reasonably in this spot. They probably don't shove these hands quite enough, but like whatever, right? They're not making that big of an error by not shoving these few spots. But I do think they call off a little bit tighter. So if anything, going back to our strategy in the big blind versus a raise from the button, you're going to see that you should probably 3-bet a little bit more often with the garbage hands as bluffs in this region, and you should probably shove a little bit more often with the hands in dark red. So like I said, ace-2 off, ace offsuit every time. Maybe ace-2 offsuit and king-7 offsuit every time, and king-queen offsuit every time. Maybe more. Which hands would make logical sense? Well, first, you probably want to start filling up some more bluffs, because you don't want to add more value hands if you're trying to exploit your opponents because they overfold, right? If your opponent folds too much, you don't, you're not trying to add more bluffs or more value hands exploitatively. You're trying to add more bluffs exploitatively. So perhaps you just add this queen eight suited every time. It's probably reasonable, right? Maybe king seven suited every time. It's probably reasonable too. If you wanted to add additional hands, you may want to add a few more value hands or hands that are kind of tough to play post-flop. Maybe start using ace 10 offsuit, king jack offsuit, something like that. King eight suited, something like that. I think that's very reasonable, right? Okay. 
Um, and, and bluffing more often for not all in size, because again, you're not necessarily trying to add more value because again, our opponents are gonna fold too often, right? We wanna add more hands in this region, especially the ones that are not so good to play. And we probably wanna be three betting fewer hands like 10-9 offsuit and 9-8 offsuit and 10-8 offsuit and queen-jack offsuit because these actually flop kinda well, right? So you'd much rather start adding the junkers down here, like queen six, king five, ace four, queen four, stuff like that. Because remember, I'm saying your opponent raises, you three bet, they're not going to call enough. So your hand doesn't really matter. Now we just want to have blockers to their continuing range, right? So if we want to have blockers to their continuing range, that's going to be an ace, a king, or a queen. So we'd much rather have those hands and these hands in this region that do have a little bit of playability. And we certainly don't want to be three betting queen jack off suit and having to fold. What are all you saying in the chat here? <clears throat> what if you're at a table where people will call all ends every time? Well, you have a very easy spot then, right? Think about it. If they're going to raise half of the hands and call the all end every time with half of the hands for 40 big blinds, I just, just want you to think about this, how bad your opponents are going to be. You're saying, Wedge, you're saying right here, your opponent's going to raise all these hands. Most people raise about half the hands on the button or a little bit more. They're going to raise and call your all in with the five high and the six high, and the seven high, and the 10 high, and the jack high. Okay, in that scenario, just shove with like the top 15% of hands or 20% of hands, and you're gonna absolutely smash them because you're gonna be getting your money in super duper far ahead, right? If your opponents play really, really poorly in a way that's very face up, your strategy becomes super easy. It's like playing, well, I was gonna say chess, thinking one move ahead. It's more like just playing tic-tac-toe. Jamming queen 10 suited versus a big blind shove. Um, you're saying that you should be calling these hands because they play well in position. Again, this is a straight GTO. I mean, look, you can. this is what the computer recommends doing. Logically, queen 10 suited is in pretty good shape. It flops pretty well. It, it has good equity. And by calling, you're going to not get to see all five cards all the time. This is just what you needed. Good. Glad to hear it. If you're enjoying the show, click the like and subscribe button. Population plays too tight. Yeah. Most people play a little bit too tight when you make them risk all of their money. Most well-studied players using strategy close to this. Correct. They are. Because, well, because they're good. Right? Most people are using real-time assistance pre-flop charts. I completely disagree. People are using real-time assistance pre-flop charts in almost all games, especially in live poker. Um, but to be fair, these are not difficult to memorize or close to memorize. And, and again, even if your opponent is using perfect GTO preflop strategy, just use the perfect GTO preflop strategy. Or if you do want to slightly exploit by being a little bit overly aggressive, because you think they're not going to take the very loose calls, or maybe you take the loose calls and they're going to call a little bit tighter because they think the population in general shoves a little bit tighter, whatever, you can push them around, right? Unless you play a low stakes bounty tournament. Perhaps you were not here at the start of the show, Joshua. We just we are discussing specifically a 40 big line scenario in the earlier middle stages of a tournament when there are no payout implications. We're not discussing anything else right exactly now. When you're discussing poker, you can't say that, um, well, not if you're playing a bounty tournament. We're not talking about a bounty tournament. What if we're playing a winner-take-all tournament? What if we're playing a game for no money at all? What if we're playing a game where if you lose, you have to take off all of your clothing? Like, you know what I mean? Like, all these... Things you can add on to this scenario to make it different cannot be discussed at the same time because it's a very, very different scenario. I already made it clear. We're discussing right here, button versus big blind. We're not discussing under the gun versus the big blind. That'd be a very different spot, right? Because the under the gun player is presumably starting with a different range. So always make sure you're discussing specific scenarios. A lot of people think you can make very broad generalizations in poker, and you just can't. You can make slight generalizations, but... You know, don't the, the farther you get away from discussing the specific scenario you're discussing is going to result in you making bad rules in your head, bad, bad heuristics. Okay, let's go back to this. 40 big blinds, big blind versus raise from the button. All right. Okay, let's discuss this scenario. Uh, here we are. In this spot, are you calling as wide as you should be? I will say, exploitatively, in a tournament, you probably want to call a little bit tighter because all these hands on the very bottom of the range 
are going to be barely profitable, right? So all these hands that are barely profitable can probably be folded. Like the Jack-4 offsuit. You'd have to be crazy to defend the big blind with Jack-4 offsuit, for example. So you probably just want to fold this. 6-4 offsuit, probably okay to fold. 5-3 offsuit, probably okay to fold. You probably don't want to defend much more or much wider than this. Because if you defend much wider than this, you're essentially saying, I think my opponent's not going to continuation bet nearly often enough. Now, let's go back to this. What if your opponent doesn't continuation bet often enough? What if they raise the button too wide and then they just check it down every time? Well, then, sure. Defend with everything. Is that every single suited hand being played? 40 big blinds deep. Yes. In a tournament against a minimum raise, 40 big blinds deep and 60 big blinds deep and 80 big blinds deep and 30 big blinds deep and 25 big blinds deep. You see in the picture here? And 20 big blinds deep. 15, do we get to fold anything yet? Nope, not yet. What about 12? Okay, there we go. I knew we'd get to fold at some point if we get shallow enough. 12 big blinds deep you can fold against some in-raise only because the minimum raising range 12 big blinds deep is very strong. When you're playing in the big blind versus a minimum raise in a heads-up pot versus the button or or uh, let's look at big blind versus raise from under the gun. I clicked the wrong button, sorry. That's my bad. Big blind versus raise from under the gun. You see, you get to play basically every suited hand every time. Justy says, wow, that's a massive leak on your part. Good. I'm glad we plugged that leak for you right here. When someone raises to the minimum in a tournament with an ante, which is basically what all tournaments do today, now you get to defend the big blind with everything that's suited. Okay? So even if they're under the gun, 40 big blinds deep, 80 big blinds deep, same thing. You get to play every single suited hand for a minimum raise. Okay? Good. Good, good. Where can you get access to these charts? These charts are available for all Poker Coaching Premium members. Some poker sites out there have less useful charts, and they charge $500 a month. And I guess people are paying because they keep selling it. This is just included in Poker Coaching Premium. Check it out, pokercoaching.com. You can get these on your phone, by the way. They're, they're available in an iPhone app. We also have ICM charts, cash game charts, heads up charts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we're always adding more stuff. We actually have a lot of new cash game charts coming out soon because we have a very, very advanced cash game course coming out right at the end of the year. I'm super excited about that. We have lots and lots of good new data for all sorts of spots. And it's going to be a lot of fun. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. In my mind, data should not be all that expensive because you run it and then you forget about it. <laughs> and uh, I think a lot of people think at this point, preflop charts should be super duper secretive and I do not. Happy to just include it. You'll find that at poker coaching, there's a lot of stuff included. Okay, so that's preflop. Let's go to 40 big blinds, big blind versus race from button. Okay, here we are. What do we do if we three bet with these hands in red and then get four bet all in? Which hands that are light red here are we going to call with? Take a second, think about it. The hands in light red, we three bet and they call an all in. I already told you, by the way, you're probably going to be better off just shoving nines and fives and fours and sevens and not three betting those not all in. In general, it's going to make your life way easier. Take a second, think about this. Are we calling it off with the ace nine offsuit, the queen eight offsuit, the 10 nine offsuit, etc.? Are we calling off with ace 10 suited and king queen suited? What about king jack offsuit? Ugh. What if your opponent raises bigger preflop? Then fold a little bit more. Definitely shave off the bottom portion of these hands. The offsuit hands are the ones you start to fold a little bit more often. And uh, maybe you can fold out the absolute worst suited hands if you wanted. It's fine. If your opponent's going to raise like three big blinds, you play a little bit tighter, right? Just get a little bit tighter and a little bit tighter and a little bit tighter as your opponents make it bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, obviously, the opponent's range is very relevant, right? As your opponent starts using a bigger and bigger preflop size, they're probably playing farther and farther from GTO. If they're using the GTO range as if they were two big blinds deep, but they make it three, then yeah, it should be a lot tighter. If they're going to be playing a tighter range, making it three, it should be even tighter. If they're going to raise 100% of hands for three, then you get to play wider, right? So it's not just as easy as they make it bigger. What should I do? You have to ask what range are they making it bigger with, right? And this is where you got to use a little bit of common sense. All right. Nobody, nobody's, uh, nobody's willing to type in the chat that they're going to be doing this. Do you need to be using solvers? I mean, look, I think solvers are very important. Fortunately for you, I have solved a lot of the very common scenarios you're going to be in at PokerCoaching.com in the tournament and cash game masterclasses. So that, um, especially if you're not studying poker 12 hours a week and you want to learn how to play all the common spots, we've already solved it all for you. It's right in pokercoaching.com. 
All right. Versus four men all in. What do we do? You call the good hands, fold the bad hands. Life's easy. The nice thing about using a polarized strategy is that you call it off with your best hands and you fold your trash. Now, R4 is a good hand to call an all-in with. You make it, they make it two, you make it six and a half, they make it 40. Feels a little bit rough. I would much rather just shove these hands, which is what I recommended preflop. Just open, shove them, or so not open, shove them. Shove them over the preflop raise. Okay, um, all the garbage obviously fold. These hands in this region also get a little bit dicey, right? Like you see Ace-10 is mixing, Ace-10 offsuit. You see King-Jack and Queen-Jack are both folding. Do you really want to be folding those hands? I don't know. Um, I would venture to say that I'd rather not have these hands in my range at this point, so I'd rather be slightly more polarized. I would rather not 3-bet the King-Jack and the Queen-Jack and the Ace-10 and instead call them. And I would much rather instead 3-bet more junk to make my life way more easier. Way more easier. Way easier. Why don't you have pocket 8s? Because you shoved all of them preflop. If you make a play with every hand, with every combination of hands that is available, you don't have it in your range if you get shoved on. So here we would have shoved all the eights preflop versus four, but all in, we don't have any eights. Therefore, it's not in our range. Same thing with ace queen offsuit. We shoved all of our ace queen offsuit. Where did ace queen go? We shoved them all preflop. Where did the jack six suited go? We don't have it anymore. Well, we called all of them preflop, right? So anyway, that's what we're doing here. Calling it off the good hands, folding the bad hands. And if anything, I like to be a little bit more polarized than these slides, these charts recommend to some extent um, exploitatively. It also makes your life way easier because you don't really want to have to three bet fold the king jack because it's almost break even. In spots that are almost break even, like like ace 10 offsuit is, king jack and ace 10 are kind of similar. You don't really want to be in those spots. The nice thing about king jack, queen jack and ace 10 is that when your opponent calls the small three bet, you're going to be dominating them a lot. So I get why you want to have them in your range. Um, so as you think you're going to get called more often, you should be more inclined to 3-bet a little bit more linearly, which is a lot of the best hands, like King-Jack offsuit. As you expect to get shoved more often, you'd much rather have the junky blockers. Okay, that's preflop from the big blind versus the button 40 big blinds deep. Nice, common, easy spot. Hopefully you know how to play it. All these charts are in the poker coaching app. Go back and make screenshots, do whatever you need to do. Again, this is specifically big blind versus button 40 big blinds deep when there are no payout implications. Now we're going to go to the flop. We've got Pyosol over here. Let's go and load a spot. Let's look at, uh, where are we? Button versus big blind. What kind of flop do we want? We're going to go through a bunch of flops. Let's go through ace five three. Pretty bad flop for the big blind. That's okay. So we click on strategy here. And now let me just explain what we're looking at if you're new here. We have our are the pot size. Can you see this? It's a little bit tiny. It says 5.9, okay? That means we have a raise to two big blinds and a call plus an ante of almost one big blind and the small blind. Five, uh, 59 here means 5.9 big blinds in the pot. Remaining sacks, 37.8, okay? So there's 37.8 big blinds remaining in the stacks. Maybe it's slightly deeper, maybe slightly more, whatever. Okay, now, here are our bet size options. We gave the solver a few options here. We can go all in for 37.8 big blinds. We can bet 5.9 big blinds, bet 3.5, bet uh, 1.5, and check. On ace 5-3, and almost all flops that contain a high card, and it's kind of uncoordinated, we're going to be checking every time. As you get shallower and shallower and shallower, you start to develop some leads, but not on this hand. All right, so we're going to check everything. Green is check. All these other colors indicate the bet size we're going to be using. So we check. What should the opponent do? Well, they should bet with everything. Why? Because they have a lot of the best hands and we don't. Notice here, our range is missing a lot of these hands. This might be a slightly different range than I just showed you for 40 big blinds deep, but it's kind of similar. Notice, we have no pairs, none of the best hands. All of them are three betting preflop, right? Um, if we go over here to like king queen, you see we have about half the king queens over here. Uh, here we go. You see we have about half the king queens, right? So the ranges are... Very similar enough, similar enough. You see we're missing some of these hands down here because they would have three bet sometimes, right? We're missing like some nine, eight offsuits, some 10, eight offsuits, right? So similar, similar range. Um, okay, so we're gonna check everything. Now the opponent's gonna bet everything. They should be betting using two sizes in this scenario, a 3.5 big blind size and a 1.5 big blind size. Anytime you see like 5.9 being using almost never, almost never, almost never, like 0.54% of the time, you can just ignore it. Okay. They should be betting big with a lot of their best hands that are vulnerable, 
in general, like Ace King, you're just using a big bet most of the time. This is a very common spot. I know that the colors are very similar here. Um, the hands that are more medium strength are going to use a small size, like King Queen. You see King Queen using a small size every time. So hands that are usually good but vulnerable like to go big. Hands that are probably good if a little bit of money goes in usually go small, like Pocket Kings, right? Almost always good if a little bit goes in, but not a lot. Hands that need less protection often bet smaller than hands that need more protection. Okay. So what are we doing here? Ace, five, three. They, let's say they bet small. Take a second and consider how you would play with this range, each hand in the range, if they bet small. Love from India. Hello, hello. Good morning, good morning. Well, we're going to check. If they bet small, do we check raise a lot? What do we check raise with? Which hand should we be check raise bluffing with? How big should we be check raise bluffing? Anybody have any ideas? Obviously, it's hard to type all this in the chat because there's a lot to it, which is why a picture says a thousand words. Let's say they bet 1.5. We're going to be check raising our best aces. <laughs> Wes just says fold. Well, uh, you don't just fold. You got to continue a lot because they bet so small. Okay. Check raise our best made hands. You basically always want to be check raising your best made hands against a small bet. Very common thing. Always check raise your best hands for value. Fine. We want to have some bluffs. What are bluffs? When we're facing a small bet size, we're going to be raising to a small-ish amount in general with our best made hands and then some draws. Draws are going to be high equity draws that we can check raise and get it in with, low equity draws that we can check raise and then fold, and then maybe some middle type draws that have a little bit of equity. So let's see what we're doing. Lots of ace-x check raising. You may say, should we really check raise ace-10? If we check raise ace-10, say we do check raise, and they re-raise us, we rip it in their face with the ace-10 offsuit and the ace-9 and whatnot, right? Feels a little dirty, but you got to realize ace-10 is one of the best hands we could possibly have here. Okay, so check raising, best aces. What are our draws? Focus on the draws here. Ace-5-3. Any hand containing a 4 or a 2 is a candidate to check raise as a bluff, and you probably want to have a backdoor draw, although it looks like it doesn't really matter. Um, ace five three no club. So take a look at this nine two suited here. You can see it like right down here, right? Notice the nine two of clubs is check raising a little bit less than the nine two of hearts and diamonds and spades. It's not that big of a deal. Whatever. Notice that you're not folding. You may be surprised at the complete lack of folds. You're only folding if you have absolute garbage, like nothing, like jack nine, ten nine, even ten nine with a backdoor draw gets after it sometimes. <laughs> so you see, like you're really not folding very often at all in the spot because you're facing such a tiny bet. Now, your opponents may bet bigger in your games. They may always bet bigger. Like say you check, they may always bet three and a half big blinds. If your opponents are good, then they're gonna be using a small bet size on the swap a lot of the time. Exploitatively, I think your opponent wants to bet small every time because most people don't defend this wide. If you give them the king nine offsuit, the king 10 offsuit, the queen jack offsuit, the king eight, Backdoor flush draw, the queen seven backdoor flush draw, you know, the jack eight backdoor flush draw. They just fold all of these. So if your opponent folds a little bit too often to any bet size, that becomes a pretty good spot to exploitatively use that size more often across the board. So if anything, I think a small bet size is quite nice here because most people fold a little bit too often. Anyway, let's see what hands they're check raising with. Some hands with twos, some hands with fours. That makes a lot of sense. These are gut shot draws. Seven, six. Very powerful draw to check raise because it's a draw to the nuts, right? Draws to the nuts are pretty good. Some junky backdoor flush draws that have backdoor straight draws, hands with sevens, hands with sixes, plus backdoor flush draws, right? Look at this. Any six kind of likes it. Well, not any six, I guess. Some sixes like it, like eight six of clubs. Look at that. Eight six of clubs likes it here. I feel like I would feel pretty pretty nasty going with the eight six, but take a look at this. Any hand with a seven that has a backdoor flush draw is not folding which may feel a little bit rough, right? But notice these are pretty good bluffing hands. Then some high equity bluffs. That's going to be pair plus draw on this board. So we have five, four check raising a lot, four, three check raising some, three, two check raising some, five, two check raising some, and four, two, which is the nuts. Okay. So some check raising here. It's 15% of the time. If I had to guess, most people probably check raise here like 6% of the time or 8% of the time. And, and that's another reason to continuation bet more often because you don't get check raise out of your seat too often. Okay, so let's say they do bet small 
Actually, you know what I want to do now? This is just the flop. We're going to try to stick to the flop today because we're going to try to keep it simple. Like I said, study spots that occur a lot. You don't get to the turn in the river all that often, at least compared to the flop. What if instead of betting 1.5 on the flop, they bet 3.5, the other common bet size? How is that going to impact our strategy? We joined a home game league and took down the first event. Nice job, T-Dubs. How is your strategy going to change if your opponent bets three and a half instead of one and a half? Now, the nice thing about this exact chart is that they're kind of using a mixed strategy kind of across the board. So you could almost translate these charts to if they use their whole range with this size or with, or with either size, right? That, that's usually not going to be the case. Quite often, they're going to be using different bet sizes with very different types of ranges. Right here, it's like 50-50. It's a pretty, pretty clean spot, so that's lucky. So what are we going to do? Notice, by the way, when they bet 1.5, we are raising 16%, calling 52, folding 32. Let me get out a notepad. I'm going to write this down so I do not forget. Oh my gosh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, probably all sorts of information. Um, let's see. 16... 5233. Why would it possibly bring up all of my information? All right. We have this here, 165233. Uh, okay. Let's consider what we're going to do. I can already tell you we're going to fold more and we're going to check raise less. How much less? Um, a lot less. About half as often as you see. 84348. 84348. 84348. So take a look at this. We're folding about half of the time against only a three and a half big blind bet, which is like half pot, a little bit more than half pot. We're raising very infrequently, basically only the best hands plus some trash draws, way fewer hands, and we're calling less because we're facing a larger bet, right? Does this assume big blind ante? Yes, it does. We discussed that earlier already. You always got to make sure you're discussing the specific scenario. If there was no big blind ante, our range would be tighter preflop because we would have folded a lot of the garbage. Okay, so what do we check raising now? Just the best hands. The best top pair in your range basically always check raises. So what is that in this spot? Ace-10 and Ace-9, right? Those are check raising some. Two pair, obviously check raising some. The nuts likes to check raise here. Two pairs liking to check raise. And then we need just a little bit of bluffs this time. We needed way more bluffs against a small bet because we were check-raising way wider for value, right? So when you have more value, you get to have more bluffs. Here, we don't have very many bluffs. Now our bluffs are going to come from probably just pretty low equity hands. So whenever you're, in, in general, when you're check-raising very high equity hands and no, like call it medium strength hands, like a seven here, you usually have fewer medium strength bluffs. As you have a wider range of value, you usually have to start mixing in all sorts of bluffs um, of, of various strengths. But take a look at the bluffs here against the big bet size. Our bluffs come from random twos, seven two, seven four, six two, six four is open-ended, nine six for just a little literal trash hand. Oh, look at Jack four getting after it for fun. Queen four, queen two, king two, right? So really like not a whole lot of bluffs. And if we do get, uh, say we do raise, and they re-raise, you see now we have to actually call, or I'm sorry, actually shoving these really bad bluffs. They're not that bad. I mean, they're, they're double gut shots, right? Double gut shots are pretty good. So we call off the double gut shots, fold out the regular gut shots, or well, double gut shots plus open-ended, and call off the best hands, okay? But so, against the 3.5 big blind bet, we actually fold a ton. So remember before, like queen seven suited with a backdoor draw was raising, right? All these hands in this region were raising some, and now they're just folding a lot of the time. And that's because we're facing a bigger bet. So do stronger draws call and lower equities check raise? No, not necessarily. You just, to some extent, check raise way less often in general. And that's going to mean your highest equity draws, which are double gut shots and open endeds, and then some trashy ones. It looks like seven two is seven two and six two are it. And I guess these over here. And what? point is the flop check raise so big you don't check raise anymore funny enough as they check as they bet bigger and bigger you actually do start to shove sometimes because then the pot becomes very much worth winning does the button have a big bet on this board it's listed right here everyone look on the flop i gave them all of these options all in 7.7 .7 for a bit more than the 5.9 pot pot 
5.9 into 5.9, 3.5 into 5.9, and 1.5 into 5.9, right? That's how you read this. Some people use all sorts of random stack depths and it makes it very confusing. I, I just, you just put a decimal, put a decimal after the first number for all these. So this is 37.8 big blinds. Okay, so that's that. Let's look at a different spot. That was ace five three. What about ace seven six? We're gonna have a lot of draws on this one. All right, on the flop, check everything. We already discussed that. They're gonna bet everything again. They have all sorts of good stuff. Notice they have lots of these middle connected hands in here, so they're gonna have a pretty nice range. They still have all the odases. Um, notice now they are using even bigger bet sizes. Why are they using bigger bet sizes? This is a common thing where as the board is more dynamic, which means more likely to change on the turn and river, such as the current best hand is more vulnerable, that's when slightly bigger sizes start to get used. And that's almost always with the best made hands that are very vulnerable. Again, ace, king, ace, queen type stuff. Like notice here, ace, king's betting pot every time. And um, some bluffs, right? Bluffs coming from a lot of hands in this region, like kind of junkers with backdoor draws, right? We have some of this king x stuff, junkers with backdoor draws. And the small bets are usually medium strength hands, like again, pocket kings, hands that are all, hands that are likely good if a little bit of money goes in, that are not actually all that vulnerable to being outdrawn. So we see like pocket kings using a tiny bet, where we see pocket eights using bigger bets, because eights is way more vulnerable than kings, right? Okay, um, draws are gonna be using all sorts of bet sizes, which again is kind of difficult to implement. I typically just put the more medium-ish strength draws with the smaller bet sizes, so we can reasonably call a raise. Um, notice, like, uh, take a look at 10-9, right? 10-9 and 9-8. These are good examples. You don't really want to be using the giant bet size with these. They basically never use pot or bigger because whenever you bet these for pot or bigger and get jammed, it's a disaster, right? You'd much rather uh, bet small here, and then if you get raised, you can continue. So you see hands like queen, jack, back, door draw, not really minding betting big and then having to fold to a, to a raise. Okay, let's say we do face the pot size bet. Again, this is the button strategy. So say they do bet pot. We're going to raise almost never in, re in the real world because their range should be so strong and polarized, right? And we're going to be doing a ton of folding on a7-6 if we don't have anything, right? Notice uh, most gut shots are calling. Notice 10-9 and 9-8 off. 10-9 uh, and 10-8 off suit are folding. 5-4 um, is calling. Open end is always going to call. The nice thing about facing a big bet size is you really do just get to fold a lot. 60% of the time against a big bet, which is great. We're raising almost none, calling logical stuff. Pairs and draws. Easy game. When your opponents bet big, by the way, life's easy. Just call your good stuff, fold your bad stuff. Nice. Nice and easy. What if they bet 3.5? We're going to be raising a little bit more, right? And um, we're still going to be folding a lot. So we're folding about half the time. Same thing. What are we going to call with logically as we're facing a smaller bet? We're we'll calling slightly more draws. Now, so now notice, got to presume these are, yeah, they're calling every time. 10, 9, and 10, 8. Raising a little bit more often with our best top pairs. Compared to against the big bet, remember against the pot bet, we're only raising just an absolute little bit. Remember I said best top pairs basically always raise. Same story, right? Um, but we're raising a little bit wider against the smaller bet. Still a lot of folding though. And then against the tiny bet, we're going to be raising far more often. So now you see far more often both for value and as bluffs. And the nice thing about the small bet is that if we do bet and the uh, if we do check raise to 5.1 big blinds, the opponent's not going to jam us very often. If they do re-raise, it's going to be to 11. Now, your opponents in the real world may jam you. Um, this is something a lot of people do wrong. They get check raise here. They have an ace, and they just rip it all in. And that's a big mistake. You'll see that most hands are not ripping it all. Actually, no hands are ripping it all in. They're re-raising small in this scenario. And they're re-raising small with a lot of good hands they can get it in, plus a smattering of nonsense bluffs. So if they do click it back, and they do get jammed on, you see, they call it off with the good hands, fold the bad hands. Funny that these are actually calling here, the tens and nines. Ugh. That, that, would, that would feel a little bit rough to me. Anyway, let's take a look at what you do against the small bet, because I do think a lot of people bet small here. In this scenario, they are um, check-raising pairs plus draws, lots of junky draws, like even like 8-3 backdoor flush draw, right, gets after it, 8-2 backdoor flush draw. Uh, this is something I really want to get in your head, though, is that against the big bet, you don't raise very often at all. And if you are raising, it's like mostly pretty good equity draws, a little bit of junky draws, and good hands. Um, against a really big bet, you don't check raise anything in a lot of spots. And 
you just call with your logical hands, you know, pairs and draws. Against the tiny bet, though, that's when you really do start to get aggressive. Because essentially when your opponent bet's tiny, it's almost like they are checking to some extent. And by check raising them, you don't let them just check it back and realize their equity with whatever they have. Notice, though, again, against small bet, you got to continue a lot. Like king nine. You're calling all the king nines or a lot of the king nines. A lot of people don't with backdoor draws. Um, no, it's king nine offsuit just folds, but with backdoor draws, you got to stick around a lot. Um, all the pairs, of course, continue, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, let's look at another spot. Somebody said they wanted to look at a paired board. Let's look at ace five five. All right, again, we're going to check almost everything. You're going to find that when you have a lot more nuts than your opponent, meaning you have the nut advantage, we discussed this thoroughly in the tournament masterclass and the cash game masterclass, so make sure you check them out. You may start to develop leads, but for all practical purposes, you can ignore them here. We're too shallow stack or too deep stack to have many leads. Two per three percent of the time, right? It's like ignore it. So we ch we check. They should actually not bet every time on this board. Why should they not bet every time on this board? Well, they don't have a whole lot of fives. They have the suited ones, but so do we. But we have a lot more of these random five X. Remember, we played the Jack Four, so we're certainly going to play the Jack Five. So this is a spot where they don't get to bet every time because they completely lack the nut advantage. Okay? In this scenario, um, they have 30, 38, 38 chips EV out of this 59 pot. So they have a big range advantage. 38 divided by 59 is whatever, 60%, 62%. So they have a big range advantage, but they completely lack the nut advantage here. Okay? So that means they don't get to bet every time. When they do bet in this spot, when they don't have the nut advantage, but they do have the range advantage, they're usually going to be betting very tiny. Okay? This is a common thing, especially on boards that the current nuts is likely to be the nuts by the river. Five's effectively the nuts, 40 big blinds deep. So, in this spot, the opponent's going to be betting tiny. If they check it back, we go to the turn and we go on from there. We're not going to look at that. But say they do bet tiny, we're going to be, we're going to be raising a lot because they bet tiny, right? And we have a lot of nuts. When we have a lot of nuts, we raise a lot. We're going to raise with a lot of our fives. Notice we have all these fives down here that they don't. So we're raising a lot of fives and then a lot of bluffs. Bluffs are logically going to be flush draws and cards that wrap around the five. Well, are usually above the five. So like seven, six and stuff like that. So take a look. Seven, six does raise a decent amount. Seven, six, eight, six, nine, six. All these are flush draws. You're going to find that typically your weaker flush draws like to raise in spots like this and your best flush draws like to call because... In this situation, the best flush draws, king high, actually have a good amount of showdown value, right? Like king 10 can just check the call and then win by the river. Notice still a lot of a folds, though, because we have a lot of total trash, right? How does the button have such a big range advantage? They have all the best hands. All of these pairs are super good. Notice they have all the pairs. Pairs on ace 5-5 five five have very good equity. Uh, okay, here we go. Take a look at this. All these pairs, I don't know if this is going to be clear for you on your end, like pocket sixes has 64% equity. That's a lot, right? So they have all the pairs and also all the aces, which are just really good. And they have a lot of good king highs. Like notice king jack has 60% equity or something, right? So this, this, all these hands are really, 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 really good. And take a look at the, uh, that small. Look at all this really, 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 really crappy red. Look at the crappy red color in here. So all of these red hands are in really bad shape. 28% equity, 29% equity, right? And notice we completely lack all of these hands. I just showed you that have very good equity. So all these hands the button has are in great shape, and the big blind is completely missing them, okay? So this is a spot where the... Button has a big range advantage, but they do not have a big nut advantage. Because if you look at the if you look at the strategy here, I mean the fives have like 90, I mean look 90, 91% equity, which is basically infinite. Okay. So anyway, we check, they bet small. We're gonna be raising a lot with a lot of 5x, not all of it, but a lot of it. And then flush draws and usually stuff like 7, 6, 6, 4. Etc. Looks like 6-4, the backdoor draw, really likes raising. So that's good to see. Backdoor flush draws are pretty good. They're going to be raising way more often. Like, notice Jack, three of hearts, has backdoor straight draw, backdoor flush draw, likes to raise a lot, which makes a lot of sense. Let's look at it one more spot, and then I got to go do the poker coaching webinar. We're going to look at 
a good one for the big blind. Let's look at, mm, I want a low one, 632. 632. We're going to start to have a little bit of leads again. If we were shallower stacked here, you'd have more leads. If we're deeper stacked, we're going to have fewer leads. Okay? Deeper stacked, you don't want to be leading because in general, from out of position, you don't want to build the pot. Okay. So we're going to check everything in general. On 632, interesting board because if you look at the button strategy, they actually do have a decent amount of pretty good hands. And while there is there are some nuts in the opponent's range, it's not like they have 6-2 offsuit and 6-3 offsuit, right? Notice 6-3 offsuit and 6-2 offsuit are folding preflop and 3-2 offsuit. So this is an interesting board where the, like, yeah, there are a lot of good hands the big blind could have, but it's only the few suited combinations. And again, notice all these over pairs are really good that the big blind does not have. When we lead, we are almost always going to be betting tiny. This is a very common thing. If you lead, you're essentially leading because you have the range advantage. Here, it's close. So when it's close, you may start to develop some leads. If they have a big range advantage, you'll be leading far more often using a small size. So when we check, if uh, the big blind had a big range advantage, like in this, the previous hand, they'd be betting tiny more often. But here, they don't have a big range advantage. Mm. Notice here, they have 34 out of 59. So it's like, whatever, 52%, 53%, whatever it is. So they don't have much of a range advantage in this spot. So when you don't have much of a range advantage, you're going to be betting infrequently. And because this board is kind of likely to change by the river, even though I know 4-3 is available, or 5-4 is available, I said 4-3, my bad. Even though 5-4 is available, um, there's not many of them, right? So this is a spot where you're going to be betting infrequently and big. So they are betting infrequently and big. By the way, if we were deeper stacked, they'd be betting infrequently and small. Because then they start to really lack the super nut advantage. And as you get deeper and deeper, hands like aces become far worse on this board when you're 100 big blinds deep or 500 big blinds deep compared to when you're 40 big blinds deep. 40 big blinds deep, you just bet your aces and pile your money in, right? But 100 big blinds deep or 500 big blinds deep, you have to be super careful. And so when you're deeper and deeper, you typically use smaller and smaller bets as the range advantage gets closer and uh, you, you lack the nut advantage. Whatever. Here, we're going to go this size. We are going to go medium or pot, but mostly medium, it looks like, with a logical range. Whenever you're betting infrequently on the button, it's usually going to be your best made hands and draws. Draws, again, is kind of a loose term because, like, jack seven of clubs. Do you think jack seven of clubs is a draw on 6-3-2? Well, you should. It's a pretty bad draw. Two over cards, backdoor flush draw. There you go. Uh, okay, so they bet. Oh, I clicked the wrong thing. Let's see. What did I do? Yeah, there we go. They, they bet. Against the 3.5 big blind bet, we're going to be raising some, but not a lot, because they raise, they bet kind of big. And we're going to start by raising our best made hands that are vulnerable. It's going to be top pairs and over pairs. But again, we don't have any over pairs, right? So it's going to be our top pairs. Remember I said best top pairs almost always check raise? Again, best top pairs almost always check raise against non-humongous bets. And then on pairs, our boards with draws that, that you're going to have a lot of pairs with, those are often check raising too. So we see 6-5, 6-4. And uh, I'm kind of surprised 5-3 is not check-raising, really, but it doesn't. 5-2, 4-2, right? These are pairs plus straight draws. These are usually good enough to raise. By the way, if we do raise, keep clicking the wrong button. Oh, my God. Okay, check, 3.5, 8.7. We're going to get jammed on sometimes, right, from the opponent with hands that are almost always good but vulnerable. Same story. And we actually call it off with these. All these hands down here. All the pairs plus draws call it off. Also, all the flush draws with gut shots are going to be calling it off because we put in a check raise to 8.7. You can't really put in 8.7 plus the two preflops. So you have 10 in your stack or 10 uh, in the pot and 30 in your stack. You need to win 40-ish percent and you will, right? All these hands win 40-ish percent. And then with your junkers, like, you know, 9-7 of hearts, you fold, right? Okay, so they bet 3.5. Here it is on us. We check raise, very polarized here. Either really good hands or junkers, right? And that's what I was saying earlier. Whenever you're putting in like a larger chunk of your stack, you're usually check raising your best made hands, your draws that can check raise and call it off, and then some really crap draws. And it looks like the really crap draws here are stuff like, well, nine, seven of hearts, queen, seven offsuit, king, seven offsuit, right? So you have to ask, are you check raising those hands? 
A lot of people don't. A lot of people are far too weak, far too tight, far too passive. They just check raise the best hands and then they lose. Um, also worth noting, any hand with a big spade is calling. I guess not any hand, but actually, yeah, any hand. Look, king eight with a king of spades is calling. Queen 10, queen of spades is calling. Kind of surprised, like, queen seven's not calling. I guess it does raise, queen seven with a queen of spades. Um, and that's because, again, we're just getting okay pot odds. You have to realize when your opponent bets three and a half, you need to realize, like, 30% equity based on the pot odds, and you probably will. I mean, let's just pretend we do check call with king 10. Turns a, whatever, king, a jack of clubs. We check. Say they, well, if they bet, we're going to fold, right? So if we have king 10, say they check it back. They say the river's a eight. Notice we get to start bluffing some of these hands, right? All these hands get to bluff some portion of the time. And when they bluff, they're ripping it in the face for three X pot. Are you doing that? We didn't discuss that today. That doesn't actually come up all that often, but we do discuss this in the advanced tournament course. So... Make sure that when you do check call in the spot with hands like king 10 of spades with, with a spade for the king or the 10, you're not just automatically giving up every single time. There are going to be a lot of spots where king high is just obviously not good on the river, and you need to find some bluffs, sometimes big, sometimes small. Poker is a difficult game. Is the Poker Coaching webinar going to be posted in Discord? Nope, it is on PokerCoaching.com in, um, in the homework section. We have a homework webinar every month where I present you a scenario and you have to tell me how you would play it. Do I have it pulled up? Uh, no, I don't. Let's see, I can pull it up real quick. We'll find out what the question is today. If you all hurry, you can sign up right now and get in the webinar. Uh, this is far too small. Well, whatever. In a tournament against competent opponents, 30 big blinds eat, the small blind limps, you and the big blind, what do you do? That should be easy. Look at the chart. Small blind limps, here's what you do. All right, suppose we raise to 3.5 and small blind calls. Flop comes king, jack, nine, and small blind checks. Ooh, fun board. This should hit the small blind pretty hard. Small blind checks, what do we do? Suppose we check it back. That's going to lead us to roughly this spot. Look at this. We're actually supposed to check almost every time. Even though we have a lot of good hands, so do they. And we have a lot of real junkers in this spot. Suppose we check. Turns to three. They check again. What do we do? We're probably supposed to keep checking. River is a seven. They bet small. What do we do? Fun stuff. Lots of raising against a small bet on the river here, especially since we check back a lot of nuts. That's not for now, though. That's for the poker coaching homework that starts in two minutes. That's going to be it for today. I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, do me a quick favor. Click the like and subscribe button down below. Also, I have a new book that just came out. Actually, it hasn't come out yet. It comes out in early December. 100 Essential Tips to Master No Limit Hold'em. If you like the show. This would be one of the tips, for example. This entire webinar would be one of these chapters in this book. It might actually be something similar enough because this is an important thing. Check it out. You can get it on Amazon or on DNB Poker. Look it up. 100 Essential Tips to Master No Limit Hold'em. It will make a wonderful holiday gift for you or for a friend. Good luck in your games. Have fun. Make the most of your opportunities. Is there a masterclass coming for Sit and Go Jackpot Flash? I don't know what sit-and-go jackpot flash is, but we do have an entire course on spin-and-goes. Is the homework webinar in the app? Mm, I'm sure there's a link. It, we do it in GoToWebinar, so I'm not sure. So, uh, yeah, check. I, I don't know what the jackpot flash thing is, but check out spin and go, the spin-and-go course. That's going to be super relevant. Probably. Good luck in your games. Have fun. I got to go. Have a good day. Thank you for being here. Click all the buttons. And I'll talk to you.